So the semen that I uh, offloaded yesterday, breaking my nofap streak, um, that was already maybe 70 to 90 days old. That was probably produced last year. That was produced on cycle, or at least, um, you know, coming down of a cycle and still having primabolin and nandrolone and whatever else floating around my system. So if you consider all of that and looking at these uh, semen parameters, man, it's pretty good. Vigor, Steve here. I have a confession to make, and I'm not very proud of this. I'm sure many of you guys are going to be highly disappointed of me, and I'm honestly a little bit embarrassed to make this video, but I had to do it for the sake of the community, for my wife's mental well-being, and to keep our marriage intact. Man, it's going to be very difficult. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to say it. Last Sunday, yesterday, I ended my nofap streak. I'm very sorry, guys. It must have been at least a week or two weeks. I was getting very proud of myself for not fapping for that freaking long. Um, but I had to leave my sample at an expert. It's not like I wanked off, jerked off in a cup and sold my semen on eBay for the highest bidder. I left a donation sample at the clinic for them to do a semen analysis. And well, the results are in and I'm way ahead. So <laughs> I'm going to discuss all of that in this video. Uh, before we get into the meat and potatoes of my semen analysis, please like the video, leave a comment for the algorithm and consider subscribing if you haven't already. Um, let's discuss the protocol that is now finally completed. This is the end of my cycle. Last Friday, I did my last administration up until, well, basically the end of February, which is now the last couple of days of February. I was on half an ampule Bayer testovirin, Bayer testosterone enthate, per week, so that's about 156 milligrams per week, spaced out over two injections, a quarter ampule on Monday and a quarter ampule on Friday. I increased the HCG that I was running from Merck Ovitrel, so that's recombinant HCG, to 1,083 IUs Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. So that's basically in between the testosterone administrations. The reasons why it's 1,080 IUs is because the Merck Ovitrel is 6,500 IUs for a half milliliter syringe so i spaced it out over six insulin syringes which is a little bit cumbersome but you know this is the most potent and uh, highest bioavailable hcg that i can find on the market right now i've been using 37.5 milligrams dhea and 12.5 milligrams of pregnenolone per day and five milligrams mebivalol this was my very basic coming off of a cycle trt plus protocol Besides that, I ran and still going to continue with injectable L-carnitine. And I had a couple weeks where, or a couple workouts where I still was using the Amino Asylum Stampede and the Amino Asylum Super Shredder, but I finished those vows. So those are out of the protocol. And besides that, I've been on the same mitochondrial support stack that I've been on for the last couple of months now. Thank you guys so much for the support during that video. It was one hour and 10 minutes long and I still got a decent amount of views out of it. Let me know down below in the comment section if you were able to incorporate some of the things that I advised in the mitochondrial support stack video and how you're feeling right now compared to before. So my stack is still pretty much the same. Five milligrams MOTS C Monday, Friday. I do the IV administrations containing 250 milligrams NAD+, 1800 milligrams injectable glutathione, 5000 milligrams vitamin C and a B100 complex. I'm taking nicotinamide mononucleotide with each meal, 175 milligrams each meal, so that's about 800 to 875 milligrams over the day. Um, besides that, I introduced 5-amino-1-MQ just for this month at 50 milligrams in the morning, 50 milligrams in the evening, evening, because I wanted to lean out a little bit, which I was able to do. I lost about five kilos this last month, so the fat loss has been good. Not that I look um, as lean as I was before I went to the United States, but I'm getting there. And as my testosterone levels are tapering down, I think I got about two or three weeks left on this diet um, to the point that I should look pretty decent. And I have a six pack again. So the dad bot that I'm going to get over the next couple of months that I'm working on my fertility is hopefully, fingers crossed, not going to be that bad. When I'm ready to reveal my physique, I'll post a picture or two on Instagram or maybe make a separate video about it, about my uh, very minimalistic approach the fat loss these last couple of weeks. Um, and I've been running a tensofensine and terzepidide experiment, two weeks on 0.5 milligrams per day tensofensine, and then switching to about one milligrams uh, terzepidide Monday, Wednesday, Friday. 
I'll make a separate video about that soon, comparing these two appetite suppressants. Uh, long story short, terzepidide wins, but I'll explain more when that video drops. So that has basically been my protocol this last month since the previous blood work results. Let's start with the testosterone readings. Instead of making you wait and having you use the timestamps to skip ahead to the <laughs> testosterone readings, um, I'm just going to start the blood work results off from that. And I did a very simple blood work result at a different clinic, which is very close to my house because yesterday I didn't have so much time. Um, so I just checked my estradiol and my total testosterone levels. My estradiol levels actually increased over the last four weeks from 69.6 .6 to 86 picograms per milliliter. So they were even already out of the reference range four weeks ago on January 27th. And now they're basically double out of the reference range. And guess what? My gynecomastia is starting to grow a little bit. And I'm not worried about that because I already got my gynecomastia surgery scheduled in early May. So that's when I'll take a whole month or maybe even six weeks off from the gym. Um, so I'm just going to let that grow and, and you know deal with the side effects of having high estradiol levels. I'm assuming that my estradiol levels are going to come down now that I've, now that I've discontinued the testosterone. Um, and I'm solely going to cruise on HCG and HMG for the next couple of months. So I'm not concerned about that. And, you know, if my gynecomastia is going to get exacerbated, that's even more tissue that the surgeon can take out. And then hopefully, you know, after the surgery and I'm fully healed, that is going to look very, very nice. My total testosterone came down with 22% from 1800 to 1400 nanograms per deciliter. So again, even though I was on TRT dosages of testosterone with such a high dose of HCG, 3000 IUs per week, I got into super physiological levels. So I'm assuming uh, based on my previous blood work results where my total testosterone was around 800, 900 nanograms per deciliter on that dose of testosterone, 150 uh, milligrams testosterone anethate per week. I'm going to assume that, well, deducting 800 um, nanograms per deciliter off this 1400 nanograms per deciliter total, I should be around well, let's say 600 nanograms per deciliter, fingers crossed. That's pretty much the same level as where my testosterone levels ended up at um, after nine months of being on, off cycle, uh, basically two years ago. So do a little prayer for me, hopefully 600 to 800 nanograms per deciliter at the end of next month. And if it's still higher than that, that simply means that there's still some lingering testosterone anethate within my subcutaneous space because I've been doing biweekly subcutaneous administrations this testosterone anethate, and also considering that Bayer testofiron is using castor oil, which extends the half-life of testosterone anethate to 34 days, guys, with subcutaneous administrations that might be even longer. So don't be surprised when my testosterone levels are still somewhat elevated on the next blood work results of March or maybe even April, eight weeks from now, nine weeks from now, um, because the subcutaneous administrations and the carrier oil is just going to make that testosterone anethate extend far beyond the you know generally accept, accepted 10 to 12 day half-life. So keep that in mind. Um, that's all the hormones that I checked. Again, I'm, I went to a new lab. The you know results are a little bit more expensive to do there. And since I just did a full hormone panel and full blood work results four weeks ago, I didn't uh, feel the need to test everything yet again. First things first, I measured my testicular volume. Um, it's a very obscure method to see how big your testicles are. So instead of doing uh, asking your wife for a reach around, you know, and cupping you and asking her, uh, you know, are they bigger than last time? We're doing it a little bit more scientifically, albeit not <laughs> the most scientific approach. What I've been doing for the last couple of years um, is basically measuring my testicle volume by teabagging my nuts in a measuring cup and then measuring the amount of water that I can displace. So I've had it as low as, what was it, 50 milliliters of water displacement. And as of yesterday, I was able to displace 70 milliliters of water. The highest water displacement I ever got was 78 milliliters, if I remember correctly. I, I probably have a decent amount of measuring uh, times, but I didn't really put that together for this blood work um, and semen analysis video. But once I have more data, comparative to the previous time I did a fertility protocol or tried to get my fertility levels to the highest possible when I came off cycle, after the, my bout with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. I measured my testicles and did my semen analysis quite frequently. So when I have more data, I'm going to put everything into a graph and then show you guys how that time compared to this time. 
Statistical volume, 70 milliliters of water displacement. After four days of abstinence, um, so that's two weeks of no fab and four days of um, well, getting busy with my wife, my semen volume was four milliliters, which I think is pretty good. I mean, I didn't even start my gorilla mode lock and load yet, or it didn't even start icing my testicles yet. This is purely me being on a TRT plus protocol with 8CG. Four milliliters of semen volume, not bad. Ideally, I'd like to get that up to six to eight milliliters um, with a you know normal and solid consistency, not too gooey, which, you know, to be fair, it was this time, as you can see from my liquefaction, it took 29 minutes for the semen to um, liquefy into something that's clear and opaque. Now, regarding the semen volume, you got to keep in mind that some of the measuring labs, I'm not exactly sure if this hospital did that, but what I read online, you know, most commonly they would add about half a milliliter to the total semen volume because some of the semen actually gets stuck to the container or the measuring device. So it might actually be like 3.5 milliliters and then adding half a milliliter to compensate for that unless they measure the semen volume by weighing the semen sample, in which case they usually take about one gram per one milliliter of semen, which is very close to um, one gram per one milliliter of water. So again, it's not the most um, accurate method to test your semen volume unless you really draw everything into a syringe and then you can probably draw as much out of the measuring cup as um, you possibly could. And personally, I've gotten very good at that drawing this very thick and viscous oil out of the Bayer test of iron amps in castor oil. Um, but again, I didn't do this measuring. I left it up to the specialist. The pH of my semen was eight, which is a little bit on the high side. That's still considered normal. If your pH of the semen is below seven, then there might be a blockage of the seminal vesicles. And if the pH of your semen is over nine, then it could mean that there's an infection present. Now, both me and my wife, we did a full panel STD test, even though it's been, well, nine, almost 10 years that we've been into a relationship. We did a full panel STD test when we got into a relationship. So good thing for us, we never had to use condoms. She was using a copper IUD as our main form of a contraceptive because I knew from all my previous semen analysis that I was not completely azoospermic when I was on uh, anabolic androgenic steroids. So she was using a copper IUD. The last time we did a SED test was when we got into a relationship. And well, we did it last uh, Sunday, so yesterday. And we're still STD free. Now we're both adults. We don't cheat on each other, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But when you're starting to prepare to have kids, it's still advised to do. And of course, the pH of your semen um, is one measuring uh, you know, method to see if there's an infection present. The other one is a urine analysis. And the last one is an STD test. The motility of my semen, 75.83%. The way they measure motility is they count 100 to 200 sperm and see, uh, based on visual cues, how well they swim. So what you want is a progressive motility over 32%. Now, unfortunately for me, they didn't make a difference between progressive motility, non-progressive motility, or immotility, which we can deduct from the total motility. A total motility of 72 or 75.83% means that there's 2417 immotility. Now, the greater motility of the semen in grades from A to D, which I believe that grade A and B fall under progressive motility, which is a semen that swims fast in a straight line, uh, basically like the Death Star trench run, you know, right on target. That's the semen that you want. You probably can never watch <laughs> Star Wars for uh, A New Hope the same way again, right? You want to stay on target. You want the sperm to swim right to the egg and then fertilize it, or at least the one that's the strongest swimmer with the best DNA. So the motility in my case is high, but I don't know the difference between progressive and non-progressive motility. Uh, progressive motility should be over 32%. I remember that the last time I came off cycle and was you know, working on my fertility without fertility medications, last time I just came off cycle, did my post-cycle therapy, and that was that, and then I waited. Um, it took me about six months to get comparable motility levels and get my progressive motility up over 32%. And, you know, hopefully uh, on the next semen analysis, I'll have to do that at another clinic, obviously, with a little bit more data. 
uh, hopefully my progressive mortality is already over 32 percent and if not then i'm just going to have to wait and proceed because keep in mind that it takes about 70 to 90 days for semen to mature and became, become ready for ejaculation. So the semen that I uh, offloaded yesterday, breaking my nofap streak, um, that was already maybe 70 to 90 days old. That was probably produced last year. That was produced on cycle, or at least um, you know coming down of a cycle and still having primabolin and nandrolon and whatever else floating around my system. So if you consider all of that and looking at these... Uh, semen parameters, man, it's pretty fucking good. And I, I, you know, maybe a little bit presumptuous, but based on this, I'm going to say that it might take, you know, maybe three months, four months for me to be like having phenomenal fertility because I'm way ahead of where I was last year. And that's because I've been using ACG and um, injectable glutathione for, well, over a year now. So I did like a pre-fertility protocol before I'm actually working on my actual fertility protocol. So, um, you know, based on this, even though it's not very detailed, I'm very happy with these results. Uh, the liquefaction was 29 minutes, which is towards the top of the reference range. Usually the liquefaction is between 0 to 30 minutes or uh, 60 minutes. Could be because uh, my abstinence was four days this time. Normally I would last maybe, you know, two days uh, on my wife's request. And you go to one of these places, and I've done it so many times now, just to, uh, you know, do a semen analysis and see what's going on uh, within my testicles besides the testosterone levels that they might generate. Um, yeah, it's awkward, right? There's no foreplay. There's no um, like romantic moment. You sit there all by yourself and they have to, uh, you know, get busy using a mobile phone and, and trying to scroll through the porn websites to find something that's somewhat stimulating. Um, yeah, so I always feel that these semen analysis are not the exactly um, true representation of the semen that you generate while you're actually getting busy with your wife, with foreplay included, and, um, you know, other methods of copulation. So, <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, well, we'll just see what happens and what changes over the next couple of weeks and months during this uh, trial period of fertility. The morphology was 27%. So that means that the abnormality of my semen is 73% through the power of deduction. But again, they don't specify if that's head abnormalities or neck abnormalities or tail abnormalities or defects, which you can separate semen into three parts, the head, the tail, and uh, the neck in between or the middle part. So I'm not exactly sure what the defects are in that sense, but you know, going to a better clinic with a little bit better testing parameters, um, I will figure that out at the end of March. So as of now, I have a normal morphology of 27%. So it's considered to be good it should be over three percent so i'm well ahead again this is very representative of what i had the semen analysis that i've had at the let's say six month mark um so I'm, you know i'm quite pleased with this motility and morphology but further testing and a little bit more scrutinous testing needs to be performed at the end of march sperm count per one milliliter 72 million per one milliliter that's very very good last time I did my semen analysis, I was about 65, 68 million sperm per one milliliter. So I didn't increase by that much, but I believe that the motility and the morphology was a little bit better. So even though the sperm count went up, the motility and morphology went down. Again, it's a moment in time. It's been three to four months since I did a semen analysis last. Um, so I think with the rate of progression, I should slowly be able to restore that and um, you know get a little bit more fertile semen going forward fun fact about sperm count just like motility and morphology that's all done under the microscope so they take a little sample and then look under the microscope what the motility the amount of uh, swimmers you have in your semen or the morphology how the semen actually looks and with the total sperm count they place a little sample on a grid look under the microscope how many semen are present within each little rectangle or square of the grid and then just count up the total and use a little formula to estimate again it's a formula estimation what the total amount of sperm are in this one milliliter so in this case it's 72 million per one milliliter the total sperm count is the amount of sperm per one milliliter uh, calculated against the volume so the total sperm count is 288 million in my semen sample i would say that that's pretty freaking good 
Um, at least most of these parameters are over the reference range, what they consider to be ideal for normal fertility. But again, we need to do a little bit additional testing to make sure that everything is going according to plan and that you know these numbers on paper are actually as good as they should be to create another life. In this lab, they didn't check the color of my sperm. They didn't check the odor of my sperm. The viscosity of my sperm wasn't checked. The viability wasn't checked, which is probably not necessary because the viability is seeing how many dead or alive semen they are when there's a lot of immotility. Now, in my case, the immotility was only 24%. So that's considered to be a non-issue. But when there's a lot of immotility, they need to check the viability and see how much of this immobile sperm is actually dead or alive. And they can check that with a viability test using various kinds of reagents and contrasts. The fructose content they didn't check. That's also in cases of asuspermia when there's basically zero sperm in your uh, semen. And they didn't check for DNA fragmentation. Now, for all of that, I need to go to a specialist. Again, this is just a normal clinic that's around the corner that can do these tests for me on the fly. And I wish they had these, um, you know, a little bit more parameters available for me so I could just go there in a hurry, uh, donate within a five to 10 minute window and then go home, wait for the testing results and not have to wait my entire Sunday uh, spending on a semen analysis. So I would say that all things are looking very, very good. I'm very, very pleased with these results. When I, gave, I got them in the mail and I started comparing them um, to my previous semen analysis, I, I knew that I was well ahead. So uh, fingers crossed, again, do a little prayer for me. I don't think this is going to take too long. Um, we checked my wife's fertility, right? We, we did an ultrasound on her uterus. We, take the, we took the IUD out already. Um, so that should give her about a month, give or take, before she can start conceiving. Um, and, you know... <laughs> It might even happen already by that time. But I'm still going to wait three to four months because, again, this semen has been produced on cycle. I don't know if there's any DNA fragmentation present, which is common um, when you're in a high state of oxidative stress. Oxidative stress is the worst thing on your semen parameters, your overall fertility levels. And even though I was on a very extensive antioxidant stack as part of my mitochondrial support stack, um, I haven't really confirmed that with a proper semen analysis at a better lab. But DNA fragmentation can also occur from the oxidative stretch, which happens from strenuous hypertrophy workout or having your testicles at a too high temperature. And keep in mind, I haven't been icing my testicles um, for these last couple of months that I was on cycle. When you train on steroids, the oxidative stress might actually go up. So this is one of the reasons why I'm going to reintroduce icing the testicles this is one of the reasons why I'm taking my training intensity down a notch. And I mean, how much can you recover from a protocol of ATG and HMG? Again, assuming that my testosterone levels end up around 600 to 800 nanograms per deciliter over the next couple of weeks. So this is basically um, just a starting point. I would say that it's a very good starting point. And going forward, the protocol is going to be like this. I'm going to keep the recombinant HCG exactly the same. 1,080 IUs. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, subcutaneous. I'm going to add in the HMG, which is urine purified HMG from Ipsa Moronial. 75 IUs Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. So that's in between my HCG injections. I won't be using an aromacin. I decided against methane. I'm just going to see where my estradiol levels end up at over the next four weeks to eight weeks. I don't feel that estradiol is um, very deleterious for your fertility levels when you're using HCG and HMG. Now, high estradiol will, of course, send a negative feedback to your HPTA. But in this case, I'm not looking to recover my HPTA function. My LH and FSH levels are not going to come back unless I do a proper PCT with selective estrogen receptor modulators or add in enclomiphene if this protocol turns out to be uh, non-effective, which is one of my alternative methods going forward. I have enclomiphene at my disposal recombinant luteinizing hormone and recombinant follicle stimulating hormone, which you can all try. But again, that's more expensive, more difficult to source. Um, and, and, you know, why not try it this way um, and then see if I can get pregnant with recombinant HCG and urine purified HMG, which contains luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone as well. But it might not be in the um, highest enough IU dosages that I'm going to need 
for real proper fertility, right? So again, time will tell. I'm going to continue with the injectable glutathione, but I might have to increase that to IV uh, 1800 milligrams twice per week, or I might do 600 milligrams um, glutathione intramuscularly in the glutes or quads um, every day, because 1800 milligram injections are actually 12 milliliters. Now, if you're doing that intravenously with vitamin C and NAD+, plus, et cetera, et cetera, then you're diluting this in 250 to 500 milliliters normal saline solution. And then you IV that over the course of, let's say, 30 minutes to one hour. But I, I probably don't have access to an intravenous nurse two or three times per week. So I can either do a self-IV administration of 1,800 milligrams with a slow push, you know, and using a butterfly needle to inject that and, and kind of slowly push that in over the course of like 15 minutes. Or I can do four milliliters, 600 milligrams glutathione intramuscularly basically every day. Now, how much of a pro-oxidant effect I will get at the site of administration that remains to be seen. I'll do additional research on injectable glutathione going forward. Um, but I'm, personally, I'm not really worried. I've injected, you know, all kinds of things intramuscularly. And now that I've done so much deep tissue massage therapy, uh, basically the last year that I switched from intramuscular to subcutaneous administrations, even that with time can be worked through and around. So I have basically prime injection sites intramuscularly in the glutes and quads because I've done so much deep tissue massage therapy. So I, I should be okay for 600 milligrams injectable glutathione, four milliliters uh, per day for the next couple of weeks to months. I'll continue with the same over-the-counter supplement stack that I've basically been on for the last couple of years now because besides testicular function, testicular health, uh, semen volume, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, many of these over-the-counter supplements, these vitamins, these minerals have a ton of additional benefits for your overall bodybuilding and fitness aspirations. I'll put them on the screen because it's an entire list. I might add in the Fedosia Agrestis and the Ashwagandha Root Extract, you know, and, and a couple of the other testosterone boosters. Now, when you look at this over-the-counter supplement stack, you can actually make it a lot easier for yourself and just go with Gorilla Mode, Lock and Load, which is, um, you know, the semen volumizer supplement that Gorilla Mode has on their website or Gorilla Mode Sigma, or feel free to combine both. And then um, based on my previous experience with Sigma and Lock and Load, um, yeah, pretty high testosterone levels and a fun for days for you and your partner. Make sure you buy her a raincoat. So make it easy on yourself, you know, go over to gorillamode.com, use Vigorous for 10% off of your order. And instead of purchasing all of these over for the counter supplements for testicular health, semen volume and testosterone levels, you can get it in two products, nice and easy. Yes, I will be icing my testicles because again, that has been shown to improve fertility parameters. So long story short, 20 minutes, ice pack wrapped in a towel, placed strategically under my nuts upon waking, probably before the workout, because then I go to a hot environment and then before bed. Um, I might do an occasional run of icing the testicles while I'm recording these YouTube videos. But, you know, if I seem a little bit chiddly and I got some, uh, you know, goosebumps, then you know exactly what's going on. You guys let me know in upcoming videos if you think that I'm icing my nuts <laughs> while recording a video. What I'll do going forward is I'll run this entire over-the-counter supplement stack through the ringer and really do my due diligence researching to see which over-the-counter supplements are actually beneficial for fertility or just for testicular health, which of course you should combine both because healthy testicles means healthy fertility in most cases, I would say, um, and then see which over-the-counter supplements are actually deleterious for your fertility or your overall testicular health. So that will be the, the first and um, of many um, fertility videos that I'm going to release over the next couple of months because it's very interesting to me. And I'm sure it's going to be interesting from some of you guys who are planning for kids in the future. You know, I've, I've set my mind to, you know, getting a dad bod over the next six to nine months, but, you know, it might not even take that long, you know? So fingers crossed, um, I can get my wife pregnant and then have enough time to kind of sauce up for the Mr. Olympia. But if, if it doesn't happen, you know, whoop de doo I can always do a cycle after going to the Mr. Olympia. And then if you guys see me there um, and you don't recognize me because I'm literally the sign of a beanstalk and I have, you know, a big fat belly and uh, not being able to see my own penis. Well, you know, just be nice and say, hey, you kind of look like Homer Simpson now, Steve. All right, I'll leave it here. 
Thank you guys so much for watching. A vigor screw, you guys know to do a front double bicep for you guys. If you live in the United States, look over at Merrick Health. If you want to do most extensive blood work, you can do anywhere in the United States. Merrick Health has got you covered with excellent patient care coordinators to help you out if you have problems interpreting your blood work results. If you're in Thailand, you go to Bria Labs. That's my favorite place to do blood work. Uh, I didn't do it this time. I went to a clinic close by, which is a very nice hospital that looked super, super nice. I'll put the address down below if you just want a casual semen analysis and blood work. And you can find most of my sponsors and affiliates down below in the YouTube description section. Gorilla Mind, Intelligent Elephant, Jim Pin, iHerb, Merrick Health, obviously. And if you're looking for something specific, something that I can't mention here on YouTube, head over to my website, figuresteve.com. There might be some more sponsors and affiliates there. Or check out my link tree in my Instagram page at Steve. Man, if I get my wife pregnant really, really fast, preemptively, I'm going to say a thank you to Gorilla Mode Sigma, Gorilla Mode Lock and Load, and the Anabolic Pharmacist for always hooking me up with the best fertility medications you can find on the planet. I'll leave it here. Thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.